Morning, Angie. Morning. And, and now it's being recorded. Uh, but uh, so uh, again, main focus on, you know, the probably the normal trans, not essentially normal transportation, but the traditional transportation that we always kind of hit you up and ask you about. But I did want to remind you that we did have um, Brian Vitulli from Mountain Metro Transit on the call. So he'll be interested to hear about uh, any sort of bus electrification or any other transit sort of stuff. Um, and uh, Monument, I know, is doing a, a major or trying to do a major um, water project, uh, infrastructure project. So uh, there will definitely be interest in hearing more about uh, general infrastructure uh, funding that's available through the bill. So right. not normal okay. transportation, vanilla transportation. We wanna try to hit as much things as, as uh, you've got stuff for. I also see a couple of our military folks um, on the, the, the line, the, the different planners from the bases uh, so if anything happened to be military related in the bill, uh, that would be of interest as well. Um, I'm not familiar, so I don't know if that is, and that be part of another bill, but on enough chance, I thought I would mention we, that's other folks we've got on the call. Great. You want me to go ahead and get started or give it a couple minutes? It's just now. Uh, let's, let's, yeah, let's give it a couple minutes and let me, um, I'll do a little introduction. Um, just more along the lines of letting everybody know that this is, uh, you know, not our typical meeting. This is, uh, we've got a little broader cross section, not only elected officials, but we've got uh, members of our technical advisory committee, et cetera. So uh, we'll probably get a little more into the weeds and really want to encourage everybody to ask questions. Sometimes when it's a, uh, a regional council meeting, excuse me, a, a board of directors meeting, you know, it's that, uh, you know, we, we focus on the, the elected officials asking questions. I want to make sure everybody understands and is comfortable that um, we want to open this up and feel free to get in the weeds since we've got a full half hour. So, All right. All right. So, um, Andy, Jessica, how are we doing back at uh, PPACG? Are we to a point we might want to get started here or wait another minute or so? Yeah, we'll get started here in just a minute. Um, back here at uh, headquarters, uh, got a handful, half dozen people in the room. Mayor Don Wilson just joined us from Monument. Uh, a couple of folks in the city of Colorado Springs, Travis and, and Gail, um, and a handful of other uh, staff members. Um, so yeah, de definitely a lot of interest. Appreciate everybody uh, uh, tuning in uh, for this. There's just a ton of stuff going on. So really appreciate uh, 
John pulling this together. I think it came out of a discussion we had with uh, El Paso Commissioner Holly Williams and uh, I think uh, Fountain City Council Member uh, Sharon Thompson a couple of weeks ago, about a month ago, with everything going on as far as uh, federal transportation slash infrastructure stuff happening at the congressional level. We wanted to dive into that in uh, a little more uh, deeply and it's really, really timely given that uh, Eric Zimmerman who's joining us uh, from uh, National Association of Regional Councils uh, I was probably up uh, all night last night reading the latest uh, text of that bill. And we're going to talk about transportation funding issues as well, obviously, with uh, um, the, the big uh, Senate Bill 260 that was passed this year by the leg legislature. A lot of opportunities for regional and um, local jurisdictional funding opportunities uh, there. So we wanted to drill into that in, in much more detail than we did at the last uh, board meeting. Um, and then obviously greenhouse gas emissions at, at the state level with the rulemaking effort there is of uh, pretty high interest. Um, so we wanted to drill into that in, into some more detail. So um, I think if we're otherwise ready to go, um, we can tee it up to have Eric Zimmerman uh, start his presentation. Um, and uh, again, really appreciate uh, Eric joining us from uh, NARC, National, National Association of Regional um, Councils, and uh, tell us about what he's uh, seeing and hearing from what's in the, the Congressional uh, Transportation and Infrastructure Bill. So with that, Eric, uh, feel free to take it away. Excellent. Well, thank you very much. Uh, thank you uh, so much for the invitation. Uh, a pleasure to be back with you uh, to talk a little bit more about what is currently going on in Washington. I do want to apologize from the outset to say that uh, literally the text of this bill came out last night, all 2,702 pages at, uh, I think it hit hit about 10 o'clock last night. So I am going to do my very best, uh, including with the presentation that in some places may be a little disjointed because I literally have been writing it since last night. Um, but I'm gonna do my best to walk through uh, what I know of what's in the bill. There's a ton of detail that of course I will not have yet gotten to. Uh, we know, uh, thankfully know a lot more about the transportation section of the bill. Uh, so I should have some, uh, most of what I have in here should be uh, very current and very accurate uh, regarding some of those elements. And if I don't hit on some of the things that you're, you've inquired about, specifically on the transit side, um, and I'm gonna do my best on the water side, um, but if you need some more on that, I'm happy to get into that during, during some time at the end. Um, so let me talk through a little bit about the high level and then I'll get into some of the details. Um, the bill uh, that was released last night uh, is the Infrastructure Investment and Jobs Act. Uh, this was previously the bipartisan infrastructure framework uh, released a couple of months ago, known in Washington as the BIF. Um, I recommend that nobody call it that, but that is what it is called here. So just in case you've heard that acronym. And then previous to that, this was the American Jobs Plan that the administration announced uh, several months ago now, qu uh, quite a few months ago now. Um, uh, and I'll get into a little bit of the contrast with that. Uh, this was a plan, this uh, final uh, agreed upon uh, framework uh, was negotiated primarily by 10 senators. You can see them listed there um, on the screen. Um, uh, there was 21 senators that endorsed, maybe 22 by the end that endorsed the overall uh, program. Uh, but 10, 10 senators were really most heavily involved with negotiating this agreement with the White House um, and uh, the bill does contain approximately a trillion dollars in total spending. The really important number for this bill is the $550 billion in new spending that it contains. That's above uh, baseline. And when I say that, what I mean is, for example, the uh, transportation reauthorization bill uh, is assumed to have a baseline of the last year of that bill. Um, and so the new spending in the bill is anything above that baseline. Now, some of these programs that are in this bill are new. And so don't, don't really have a baseline. They haven't really been spent on before, but something like the transportation reauthorization, the water reauthorization, uh, they have baselines and this is spending that goes above and beyond that baseline. Um, so uh, $550 billion in new spending, that's about a quarter of what the president had originally proposed in his jobs plan. Um, and down slightly from the original deal uh, that was brokered a few weeks ago, but then was modified and changed in order to get final agreement among, uh, among senators. So what this bill has in it uh, are uh, a couple of reauthorization bills. So it does include the Senate Transportation Reauthorization Bill as written by the Senate EPW Committee. It also contains uh, a, a water infrastructure bill uh, passed by the Senate. 
and then has some additional items that aren't traditionally in any type of a reauthorization, uh, or at least not surface transportation reauthorization. And those include power, electric vehicles, uh, resiliency funding, airports, broadband, um, and so a pretty wide array of, of, of infrastructure, certainly uh, quite a bit beyond uh, what we typically see in a surface transportation bill, reauthorization bill, but not as broad as I think what the president had originally proposed in his $2.2 trillion plan. So there has been certainly some, obviously some scaling with the, the smaller size of the bill, but uh, uh, several areas that, uh, that the president wanted to focus on are not included. And as I mentioned, the text of this just became available uh, late last night. So this uh, package provides funding in three ways that I think it's important to understand. Uh, first is the base authorization. So that would be the Senate EPW bill that passed out of committee uh, a number of months ago and then passed through the entire Senate uh, a month or so ago. That's kind of your base authorization. That's what they would be authorizing if they had just done that bill. Then within that authorization, the, the, the new agreement, the Infrastructure Investment and Jobs Act, adds some additional funding within the authorization bill that increases funding for certain areas. And then there's also supplemental appropriations that are assumed over the next five years. So these are basically uh, sort of guaranteed appropriations, which is a very interesting way of doing this. this is pretty unique. Um, and these are funds taken from the general fund to support some new areas and then some areas that were otherwise in the authorization bill. And I'll hopefully get into that and make that a little bit more clear. Um, as I mentioned, very unusual that the bill includes some amount of future guaranteed appropriations and really creates some confusion uh, when it comes to knowing what the bill contains for different areas. So for example, EV charging uh, for the electric vehicle charging infrastructure gets two and a half billion dollars in the authorization bill and that base authorization, but it also gets $5 billion in advance appropriations that will be coming over the next five years. So in total, EV charging gets $7.5 billion. But if you just look at the authorization program, it only gets $2.5 billion. So the way that this bill functions and the way that it's able to reauthorize the transportation program specifically, I'm sure everybody here is well aware of the shortfall that exists within the, highway, the Federal Highway Trust Fund, uh, which is where the transportation program is funded from, uh, which itself is funded with gas tax receipts is woefully short because the gas tax isn't bringing in as much as it used to uh, and certainly isn't uh, bringing in enough to keep up with uh, expected levels of spending. Uh, and so basically there's a $118 billion transfer from the general fund into the highway trust fund that is pure deficit spending um, in order to prop up the highway trust fund and keep the transportation program uh, authorized and moving into the future. In addition, I'll talk a little bit about this, happy to talk some more. Uh, in the Q&A if folks want to hear more, but there is literally an enormous amount of spending for competitive grant programs. The DOT and FHWA are going to be extremely busy in the next year or two years doling out the funds that this bill contains uh, to a number of areas. I'll get into a few of them uh, as I move forward here. So getting into the dollars and cents, I don't want to belabor this too much, but you can get a sense for where Congress is putting its funds. Uh, the biggest winner, of course, is roads, bridges, and major projects, uh, mostly on on the on on uh, highways. Uh, obviously, um, uh, you know you've got a, a very large investment for uh, power infrastructure, which I'm not going to get into too much here. We've got another large investment in passenger rail, 66 billion dollars there, 65 billion dollars for broadband, and, and sort of on down on down the line. Um, I believe these are accurate. These were before the bill came out last night. I think most of these things have stayed the same. So I think this is a, a pretty accurate picture of what the bill contains and where that $550 billion in additional spending is being committed. So this is another way of basically saying the same thing. The, the current deal are the same numbers you just saw on the previous screen. You can see how that contrasts to the original deal. Most of the things uh, stayed the same. Uh, if you're a fan of the infrastructure bank, that was, again, eliminated. It's Washington's uh, best idea that has never gone anywhere. Um, it still remains not going anywhere at this point. Um, but most, you can see most, thing, most things stayed relatively the same. So uh, getting a little more specific into some of the areas that the bill contains, for example, the roads, bridges, and major projects. So the way that the 110 additional billions of dollars are spent for that program, about half of that is for increased highway trust fund contract authority that goes to FHWA. So that's that's your reauthorization funds, basically. 
So uh, the bill contains the, the $110 billion includes approximately $55 billion additional dollars for the, uh, the reauthorization of the program relative to the funding it received under the FAST Act. Um, and then the other half of the funds go to a number of other discretionary programs. Many of them, as I mentioned, are discretionary grant programs. Some of them uh, are formula, but most of them are, are discretionary grant programs. Uh, a lot of it, the, the bulk of it, the majority of it going to the new, a new bridge program. Uh, uh, you also see a pretty significant increase in the raise uh, grants program uh, and on down the line, a new $5 billion mega projects program. This is sort of your uh, projects of national and regional significance. Um, you've got infra grants increase and then some smaller amounts for a few other, a few other programs. So that's, that's how they sort of break down that $110 billion that they provided in, uh, in road funding. So this chart has a lot of numbers on it, but what I wanted to do is to give you a little bit of a sample of sort of how this bill works. So for example, I think the bridge program provides a good example. So you can see under FHWA bridge, there's $27.5 billion are gonna go out in a formula to the states for this bridge program. And then there's another $9.2 billion or so that will be competitively uh, provided. So that will be, you know, whoever qualifies, and I haven't looked at the qualifications yet for that, but whoever qualifies will have to obviously apply to USDOT, UST, or FHWA, in this case, FHWA will make the decisions about where those funding go. But in addition, there's also $3.2, $3.3 billion provided in the, in the authorization itself from, uh, from uh, the highway trust fund. So uh, in total, there's some $40 billion for this new bridge program, but it's provided in three different ways throughout, uh, throughout the, the, uh, the bill. Um, in addition, infra grants are another good example where they get $3.2 billion in competitive funding. The reauthorization uh, uh, provides $4.8 billion. And then this, uh, the, there's an additional, through the highway trust fund, and then an additional $6 billion provided in general funds uh, but also through the reauthorization. So it, it does get a little bit confusing, but you can see here are uh, some of the competitive areas with, that the office of, of the secretary will be, uh, will be responsible for, as well as FHWA. So these are some areas where there are certain to be some, some new opportunities uh, for areas to be getting some funding for some, uh, for some you know, uh, uh, projects. Uh, including, as I said, mega projects, the RAISE grants, which are resiliency uh, focused grants. You've got Safe Streets, which is a complete streets type program. Uh, culverts, uh, which is a state driven program, but, uh, but has funding obviously for, for culvert uh, building and rebuilding. Uh, a very significant investment in bridges. Uh, some amount going to EV charging, which I think will have a, a local component or does have a local component to it. Um, so you can see these are these are really some of the areas uh, where we're, you can expect some new opportunities will be arising uh, here over the next period of time as this bill starts to get, get implemented. Um, I'm not gonna spend a whole lot of time, but we're now basically able to start to hone in on the Senate EPW bill um, as our base bill. That is what is included in this bill. Um, it is expected and, and uh, uh, it is expected that this will not be conferenced with the House bill. So the House bill may be, maybe there's still some process to be worked out here, maybe dead. Um, uh, and so we may be honed in and focused in on the Senate reauthorization bill as the final answer um, from where I sit. Uh, and that's vis-a-vis -vis where, from where many of you sit. That is not necessarily great news. The Senate EPW bill uh, does not contain the level of policy that and, and funding for things that are important to local areas and regions uh, that I think uh, that we would like to see. Um, for example, the Senate bill uh, does not increase the STBG suballocation level. Uh, the House bill does. Uh, that's, you know, some, that percentage, by increasing that percentage, more funding is provided to local areas for, uh, trend, for, uh, for MPOs to um, prioritize projects. So that's a that's a real loss as well. Um, there are uh, a pretty wide number of, of projects within the House bill uh, that also would have provided additional local funding in ways that I think would, would have been or, or are really valuable. And it's not quite dead yet, but, uh, um, but it, it, it may be on its way out. So, um, you know, 
I will also say, however, that the Senate bill contains a lot fewer responsible or a lot fewer requirements for MPOs. So in some sense, that that I guess is a, a positive on that side, but but it is a shame uh, that we're losing the opportunity uh, on on some of these other things within the within the House bill potentially. Um, so you can see some of the funding levels. I, I'm not going to get too much into this. Both bills contain pretty significant STP funding increases, even if the Senate bill doesn't increase that sub allocation percentage. Um, TAP, there are very good changes made to TAP in both bills, so those will be preserved with this, the Senate bill passing. Um, you know, and you can see down the line, metro metro planning was a little bit better in the House bill, but you know, still uh, a pretty good bump uh, in metropolitan planning funds. Um, and and on down the line, you can kind of see the the comparison of what's in that Senate bill. Um, you know, the Senate bill uh, did have does have some some fairly good new programs. It does have some additional focus on on uh, climate. The House bill had a much stronger focus on climate. Um, so if that's something that's important to you, you know, there's a there's a, some some trade offs there. Um, the Senate does have a carbon reduction program. It also has a this protect resilience program. Um, so you know that's not to say that the Senate doesn't have anything in it that that is positive. I don't mean to be too dire about it, um, but you know uh, we'll, we'll see. How, uh, you know the the but the the fact of the matter is is that it doesn't contain as many good provisions for local areas. So. Um, this is a ton of words that I'm certainly not going to read. I am no water expert, uh, unfortunately for you. Um, maybe you can find somebody else that is. But what I did is pulled some of the analysis that the National League of Cities did for, uh, on the uh, Senate water legislation that recently passed, and that's now included in this bill, which includes uh, significant increases for the, the Clean Water State Revolving Fund and the Drinking Water State Revolving Fund, uh, a, a significant new resources for uh, disadvantaged communities, um, uh, lead drinking water, lead and drinking water uh, grants, uh, resiliency and sustainability grants, um, a focus on new and emerging technologies uh, with some new grant programs expected there, um, sewer overflow and stormwater reuse uh, grants for municipal areas, and then uh, some focus on workforce as well. So there are obviously uh, significant new uh, investments that are going to be made uh, with federal dollars into a number of areas. Um, and I hope that the projects that you all are working on are going to nest, nestle into some, some of these funds and, and will be uh, eligible for some of the funding that will come through this program. So I guess uh, part of the question here is, is what's going to happen with all of this? And then I'm happy to answer some more in the details if folks want to hear some more about that. The magic eight ball, if you shake it, does seem to say that signs are pointing to yes on, on this bill. Uh, it does seem that something is very likely to happen. Uh, it remains uh, very likely that if it does happen, it's going to go very quickly, at least in the Senate. Um, the Senate could take up another cloture vote on this uh, to cut off debate as early as Wednesday. Um, they do need to give it uh, a certain number of hours of debate and before they can call up that cloture vote. They've also indicated there will be an amendment process. Um, but the cloture vote, if taken, would also cut off amendments, the, the amendment process to some extent. Uh, and so uh, it does seem like we could get action on this very possibly this week, um, and it would be through the Senate. Now, the House, for its part, is out for the next seven weeks. They're not actually back until later in September. Uh, wow. And so it seems possible that this will hang out for quite a while until the House mm -hmm. gets a hold of it. There's also, as I mentioned, some significant questions about the overall House process, simply because Chairman DeFazio of the Transportation yeah, and Infrastructure Committee, which was responsible for passing its version, its uh, transportation reauthorization bill, is mad as heck and has been making it known that he's mad as heck, that he's got a bill that he thinks is a great bill and that he's not even going to get, get the opportunity to conference on that bill, potentially. Um, and so the question then remains, is he able to pull votes to stop this bill from happening? I think that is probably unlikely. Is, uh, is uh, Speaker Pelosi uh, going to accede to his demands and, and take a drastic action that stops this from happening? I also think that's unlikely. Um, I think that uh, in some ways the House is going to get jammed on this and they're really not going to have much of an opportunity to go back and forth. Um, that really it's going to be a take it or leave it kind of proposition, um, especially because the the agreement in the Senate is fairly fragile. It's not like 
they can make huge changes in one direction and that you're gonna keep all of the senators you need on this to keep this bill moving forward. Um, there's also talk of the second three and a half trillion dollar uh, reconciliation uh, infrastructure bill, which is sort of more focused on, I guess, soft infrastructure or human infrastructure. Um, and it remains to be seen. There has been some discussion of coupling those. Um, again, I think that's a tricky proposition. And I think uh, there's going to become a recognition that if you want uh, if you want this uh, reauthorization bill, this, this trillion dollar bill to get through, you really need to decouple those. Uh, you need to let them move separately and then work on that uh, reconciliation package separately because that one can pass with only democratic votes and that's the whole design here. Uh, and so we still may see an opportunity within that second reconciliation package if that's to move. There's some question about that um, based on the politics that we could see some areas that were left out of the original package that that Mr. DePazio, for example, wanted some focus on, we could see those focused on in the in this second reconciliation package. So it's not necessarily that all bites of the apple would be gone uh, once this this trillion dollar bill goes. Um, but I do think there's there's some there's more uncertainty surrounding that reconciliation bill. Um, and I believe that's all I had for now. So that's that's uh, the latest and greatest from Washington. There's still much to digest on this, and I'm happy to come back and do some of that digestion with you later. But for now, I am happy to take questions and get into some of the details of folks want to. Uh, thanks, Eric. Yeah, we will definitely take you up on on, on having you back. Um, but uh, and and as it is, I think we've only got seven minutes for questions. So Jeff uh, Sudemeyer, I saw you're on the call. We're going to start you a little late because there's no way we're going to get through uh, questions in seven minutes. Uh, Eric, can I trouble you to send us your slides uh, so I can send them out? We have a couple of people who are audio only, uh, and we do have uh, some folks that uh, um, have uh, visual uh, impairments, so that way they can get them and blow them up so that they're bigger. So if you could- Absolutely. Them, great. Um, we're going to go ahead and start with the questions. If you're in the um, conference room, go ahead and just sort of raise your hand so Andy can see you. Um, if you're on the uh, Zoom chat, just uh, use your raise your hand issue and, and we'll, we'll call on you. Um, I do know that Andy had a question. So Andy, you wanna start with the, uh, the question, your question and we'll kind of go from there. Sure, thanks, John. Great info, Eric, really, really appreciate this. Um, it, not to get into the weeds too, too much, but metropolitan planning, I know there was an increase and that, that's the funding source that helps fund MPOs uh, like us at PPACG. And we've been having these conversations with other MPOs um, about the need to do something with the, the uh, metropolitan planning funding level to help support our operations and all the stuff we have to do with our um, with our staff. But I know there was an increase in the House version. Senate looks like there was a decrease from the House to what the Senate has. But was there was there an overall increase in the Senate bill from what you could tell so far? Yeah, that's it's a it's still a decent increase. Both bills had a decent increase. It is about two hundred million dollars less in the Senate bill, which is uh, a little bit unfortunate. Um, as I mentioned some of the trade off there are fewer mandates that are contained in the in the Senate bill. Um, those mandates, of course, can cut both ways. Sometimes uh, it's nice to be required to do something if you want to be doing it. Um, but that doesn't always, you know, but the, the simple fact of the matter is there are less things that are going to have to go into your plan as a result of the Senate bill than the House bill uh, in terms of a, of a requirement. So um, I guess that's the trade off, you know, but uh, it is, you know, 200 million spread over the country isn't a ton, but it, it is a fairly substantial difference. So, um, but but yes, the Senate bill does have a, still have a fairly su significant increase for, for planning. And uh, I don't see any hands up on Zoom right now. Um, so I'll ask something. Uh, oh, wait, I've got uh, Dave Donaldson. I'll, I'll defer to, <coughs> excuse me, our paying customers. Go ahead, Dave. Yeah, thanks, Eric. Uh, I'm Dave Donaldson, uh, Colorado Springs City Councilman. Hey, can you just define or explain to me what falls under resiliency in this uh, bill? Uh, yes, well, part of it is definitely, uh, there's a significant uh, program under the Senate reauthorization bill that was included in uh, as part of the base bill. Uh, that is definitely a significant portion of what they're including. Um, I'm trying to see if I have detail here in front of me on some of the other resilience. So, so part of the challenge here is that we knew a lot about the transportation focus sections, but we're just now getting our hands on some of the other sections of the bill. Um, and I don't, what I have sitting in front of me, it does not immediately pop out with, with what the resiliency focus is on. But I do know 
uh, a good chunk of it is transportation focused within uh, the confines of the reauthorization. But I do think that there is some additional funding beyond that uh, within the within the broader agreement uh, that would also be uh, classified as as uh, as resilience. I will get some detail on that, and I'm happy to send it over to John, and he can share it out with you. Okay, and then the, this is maybe even more of a basic question than you're used to. What um, defines resilience here? What kind of projects fall under that category? What does that mean? Uh, in I mean, this, I think they're setting. Yeah. There, I mean, I think they're focused on anything that helps make the, the system either more redundant or more, better able to withstand any of the challenges that may come, specifically, obviously, weather uh, due to climate and things like that. Um, so it is, it is both, um, you know, rebuilding, reinforcing uh, uh, facilities in order to make, help them withstand you know, whatever is perceived as the challenge within the area where, where you are. So obviously it's gonna change a little bit place to place, but I think that generally is what they're trying to get at with, with some of these resiliency funds. I'll look forward to uh, more information in the future. Thank you. Yeah, absolutely. I'll get that over to you, Dave, thanks. So our next question, uh, uh, Councilperson Sharon Thompson is in the conference room. Sharon, your question, and then we'll go after Sharon. Thank you, John. Uh, when the slides are sent out, could we please get a definition of some of the terms that are in there? Because I think there were some programs that I'm not familiar with as far as funding sources. And um, so if there's something new in there that we wouldn't be familiar with, like, you know, TIP or STIP or something, sure. um, please, please put the definition in, uh, John, if you could just real quick when, you, when the slides go out. Yeah, we'll take, we'll take a look at it. I'll work with uh, Eric. If there's a, a glossary of new things that I don't even know, we'll, we'll grab those and We'll send those along, probably a, a follow-up email after we send out Eric's slides. So, yep, we can certainly do that. Um, uh, Commissioner Williams, you're next. Uh, yes, my question is probably the same as Gil's is, is that um, are there any Colorado earmarks in the bill? I didn't see any. Uh, we have a serious problem right now, obviously, with I-70 through Glenwood Springs. And I noticed probably set up from long ago, way back in Senator Byrd's time, there's the Appalachian Highways Fund, but um, it's looking like in the future with all these forest fires, we might need some type of Western forest fire fund to cover our freeways because it's really killing commerce right now in the state of Colorado to have Glenwood Springs closed for an unknown amount of time on I-70. So I don't know, I didn't see any initial earmarks searching the text, but if you have any ideas about that, Eric, we would appreciate I, it. I do. So the House, for its part, did uh, include earmarks in its base bill. The Senate, uh, we suspected under normal circumstances, would have countered at a later time with earmarks of its own if they got to sort of a traditional uh, uh, back and forth conference. Um, however, the Senate wanted to move quickly, so it didn't include those earmarks in its base bill. As a result, now that that bill has been taken up into uh, this broader agreement, my my best guess is that they are not going to be earmarking that bill, uh, and that the bill will go uh, as it as it is written now, and that that does not include include those earmarks. And I know there's going to be a lot of disappointment across the land about that. I think there was a lot of hope uh, that there was going to be some specific projects that folks were going to be able to get some get some focus on. Probably already had it in the House bill, um, but but because the Senate never got there. Um, and because they now have this agreement, it, it seems likely that, that that part of that agreement will be that there's not going to be earmarks in this in this final bill. Okay, thank you. Sure. So I don't see any other questions. I'll just uh, maybe as a wrap up question so we can uh, move on to the next part of our agenda is uh, what's the bottom line on this, Eric? Uh, so most of this seems to be going through the traditional sort of process. So for our jurisdictions, as far as the projects they they have it'll be sort of business as usual um go through the you know the ppacg process and get your money uh program through the tip process and then make sure you're it's consistent with the long-range plan but it seems like there's a lot of new competitive sorts of programs um that would be out there so for that is is the bottom line and the suggestion to my jurisdictions uh get your projects quote unquote shovel ready uh to go through that uh, those processes process eyes uh, so that way uh, we can take advantage of the funds here in, in, in our region. What, what's, what's sort of the bottom line on how we get our paws on this, on this dough? Yeah, I mean, I think it's going to be a matter of 
paying attention to some of the particulars, of course, um, with any bill like this, especially on the competitive grant side. Of course, they've written into the bill a, a, a stunning amount of detail about you know, how they should make decisions about these, but really the important part is when DOT um, you know, starts to make some decisions about how they're actually going to distribute these funds. Um, so you're gonna to wanna to pay attention now to some of the details that are in the bill that'll give you an idea of the types of projects that, that they're gonna fund. Um, and that'll give you an idea of some of the things that you're gonna to wanna to start sort of prepping and, and, and thinking about. Uh, but then as detail sort of comes out over this next period of time, probably six months to a year, uh, as DOT really puts the, the, the details into these programs, how they're gonna make these decisions, then you'll really know whether you qualify, you'll really know the types of projects they're going for. Um, one of the things that we know um, is that there's, uh, the administration has really sought a focus on ensuring that a large percentage of the funds go to areas that are uh, considered disadvantaged. Um, so that's going to be key. Um, I think there's going to be, because it's a Senate reauthorization bill, a good balance between urban and rural. I think that's something else to keep in mind. Um, so I think there are some, some elements in here um, that you can start to look at now, and then you know we'll see how they play out over, over the coming uh, weeks and, and months as they start to initiate these programs and put them into place. Awesome. So if there are no other questions for Eric, which I don't see any, uh, Eric, let me just uh, thank you again for taking the time to uh, uh, walk us through what, what you're seeing. Um, I know you're probably sleep deprived and got 10,000 other things to do, but um, if you're able to hang on on the call for a little bit, um, I think given uh, how you sort of monitor what's going on in the different states, you might find the next uh, presentation from Jeff Sudemeyer very interesting um, as he's gonna kind of go over um, Colorado's a recent uh, transportation funding bill, SB 21-260, uh, uh, that created a lot of different funds uh, for uh, a transportation. So if you can- Absolutely, here's some time, happy to. I, I think you might find it interesting, uh, but if you if you do uh, sign off the call and, and need to take a nap, we would certainly understand. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, Thanks, John. Thanks so, for having me. Yeah, and so uh, Jeff, with that big buildup, uh, uh, knowing that anything you say now is Eric's going to take and spread out to the uh, the other uh, 50 states or 49 states, um, no pressure. But uh, uh, you're up next, and just by way of introduction, uh, for for those of you who don't know, uh, Jeff did a, a presentation on the funding um, sources and eligibility uh, at our last board meeting, but we we kind of constrained him to about 10 minutes. So he's, he's gonna do a little deeper dive, but not too much, but because he wants to leave a, a, question, a time for questions from you all. Um, so if you see the, the presentation looks a little familiar, I think it's what he was using as a base for uh, the last board meeting. But to that extent, I think a lot of you have not had an opportunity to see it. Um, and again, we wanna take a little deeper dive with questions at the end. Uh, so with that, uh, Jeff, uh, thanks for being with us today and I'll turn it over to you. And uh, let us know if we want to uh, make you co-host so you can share slides. Sure. Uh, thanks, John, and and happy to uh, join you again. And um, yeah, actually, if you uh, if you do want to make me co-host, I will just go ahead and pull up uh, the uh, the same deck that I uh, I presented uh, several weeks ago here, and um, I will um, I'll, I'll kind of walk through this deck again. So apologies for for those of you that uh, where uh, you're hearing some of this twice, but. Um, I uh, want to kind of go through again the uh, the high level, the the different sources, and then I want to probably more um, today want to just make sure that there's time that you have an opportunity to ask uh, ask any questions, and we can kind of get into whatever detail uh, is uh, of interest to this group. So um, let's see if uh, um, John doesn't look like I can share. Just yep, oh, there we go. Share screens. So let's let's see if I can make this work. I am seeing your screen. You are sharing. You're a sharing. All right. Let me uh, let me get my screen where I need it. Um, bear with me just a second here. Um, all right. So um, let me pull this up here. So I'll, I'll what I will do this morning is I'll um, I'll kind of again just give a quick recap to the overall funding package and then. 
relatively quickly run through each of the individual funding sources. And um, please feel free to uh, to stop me as we go. But otherwise, uh, I will um, I will open it up and take whatever questions you have at the end. Um, so I, th I think the slide in front of you should be this uh, Senate Bill 260 at a glance. Um, this provides kind of the, the big picture overview of the bill. Uh, the bill itself is about a $5.4 billion bill. Um, that's over an 11 year time frame uh, through fiscal year 32. Um, of course, these are these are estimates of uh, of revenue we think will be generated by the uh, the fees and transfers in the bill. I'm just on a webinar. Um, of that uh, five of, uh, of either upfront stimulus funding uh, or in the form of general fund transfers. Some of those general fund transfers upfront, uh, some of them on an ongoing basis beginning a few years out. Um, the, the fee revenue itself uh, does not start being assessed until fiscal year 23. So we won't actually see any collections uh, of new fee revenue for, uh, for uh, at least a year. Um, most of the fees uh, phase in over a 10 year period, not all, but, but uh, most of them follow a schedule uh, where the fees uh, start at a smaller amount and then escalate uh, over the 10 year period. Um, at the end of the 10 year period, uh, so beginning in fiscal year 33, the fees do not go away. Uh, they just uh, switch uh, from, uh, from sort of a pre-established uh, schedule uh, to, uh, to being fixed uh, to inflation going forward. So the, um, uh, the bill obviously directs resources to the state and local HUTF. Um, it also directs funds to CDOT for the Multimodal Options and Mitigations Fund and the Revitalizing Main Streets Program. Uh, the majority of, uh, of dollars through both of those programs are ultimately uh, passed through uh, to locals. Um, it establishes four new enterprises. Uh, one is a, non, a new non-attainment enterprise uh, at CDOT focused on air quality mitigation projects in the front range non-attainment area. Um, it establishes three quote unquote green enterprises uh, focused on the electrification of the transportation system. Um, one of those enterprises is with the Colorado Energy Office. One of those enterprises is with the Colorado Department of Public Health and Environment. Uh, and one is hosted by CDOT. Um, it also modifies the existing bridge enterprise, uh, expanding the scope of that uh, enterprise uh, to include tunnels. Um, so as the name suggests today, the bridge enterprise is focused only on repairing poor, poor rated bridges. In the future, it will also include uh, maintenance, uh, uh, capital maintenance of tunnel assets. Um, finally, I'll note that the bill, the bill really made possible the third and fourth tranche of COP debt issuances uh, under Senate Bill 267. Um, Pre-Senate Bill 260, uh, there was, uh, I will say, question about uh, the, uh, the repayment structure that would exist for those final uh, two tranches of COPs. Senate Bill 260 essentially uh, outlined, uh, put in place uh, a, 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 shared, uh, a shared plan for repayment uh, that uh, provided CDOT with uh, some upfront funding to help cover debt service over the next few fiscal years, and then put in place uh, general fund transfers beginning in fiscal year 25 that will, would al allow us to uh, pay for a large portion of that debt service going forward. Hey, hey Jeff, we have uh, some some relatively uh, new folks who've joined the PPACG uh, sure. uh, 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 leadership in the last uh, a couple of months. So I, I've been made aware that sometimes we drop uh, uh, acronyms a little too frequently in transportation. Sure. So I think the, the one that I heard uh, used that may be not everyone's familiar with, uh, Certificates of Participation or COPs, can you really just uh, explain what that is uh, real quickly for some folks? Ab absolutely, and thanks for the, uh, the reminder um, uh, that we do have some new folks. Um, so Senate Bill 267 is a bill from 2017 uh, that authorized CDOT through the state treasurer's office to issue uh, four debt debt issuances um, uh, over the course of, well over the course of four years, five hundred million a year for four years. Um, the debt instrument uh, in this case is a certificate of participation. Um, what that essentially means is that the debt issued is backed by state assets, in this case, uh, state buildings. And uh, really, in a COP structure, technically, it is uh, a lease purchase agreement. So essentially, uh, we are um, putting up 
state building assets as collateral, and then we're leasing, uh, leasing those, making lease payments against those assets for the period of the, uh, the debt service. So we, um, we issued uh, um, the first tranche of Senate Bill 267 in September 2018. Um, the second tranche, I believe, was May of 2020. Uh, and then we did the issued the third tranche of 267 COPs just this past May. Um, that leaves us with one more uh, tranche of certificate of participation that we'll be issuing uh, probably in the early part of calendar year 22. Okay, so um, uh, moving on just a little bit, and, and John, please feel free to, to chime in if, you, if I, I need to, to uh, uh, explain an acronym that I, I throw out uh, quickly uh, again. Um, uh, this slide here just shows the, uh, the makeup of the fee revenue, again, out of the $5.4 billion package. $3.8 billion of that package is composed of new fee revenue. Um, the... Uh, 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 includes a, a number of fees, um, the road usage fee uh, and the bridge and tunnel enterprise fee uh, are essentially per gallon fees assessed on gas and diesel fuel. Uh, and, uh, and those fees uh, uh, begin uh, at about a two cent per gallon increase and then they escalate uh, over the period of, uh, of 10 years uh, through fiscal year 32. Uh, the, um, uh, EV equalization fee uh, is an increase to an existing uh, electric vehicle registration fee. Um, the uh, the uh, increase is essentially intended to create parity with what someone is paying uh, that drives an internal combustion engine. So at the end of the 10 year period, when the fee is fully phased in, uh, the amount of registration fee that an EV dr driver is paying uh, is intended to be roughly equivalent to the average driver um, of an internal combustion engine. Average meaning average MPG, average number of miles. Um, the bill also creates a TNC fee, that's a transportation network company fee uh, that would be assessed on uh, Uber and Lyft rides, uh, TNC rides. Uh, that fee does not phase in. It, fa it, it's, it starts at 30 cents and uh, I believe um, is indexed to inflation. Um, uh, 30 cents uh, per ride. Um, there is a new delivery fee that is also created by the bill. Um, that's a delivery fee on uh, essentially online retail orders. So that would mean everything from an Amazon package uh, that you order online and that's delivered to your door uh, to food delivery that you might make through a DoorDash or a Grubhub or a similar app. Um, that's a 27 cent fee per delivery. Um, that also doesn't uh, follow a fixed fee schedule. It just starts at 27 cents uh, and then is indexed uh, to inflation going forward. Uh, then finally, the bill modifies a couple of existing fees related to car rentals that were put in place by, by the faster legislation uh, of 2009. And uh, essentially that just has the effect of broadening uh, the base that that uh, car rental fee applies to. So to kind of give you a picture of what this, uh, this all looks like uh, together, um, you'll, you'll see on this slide uh, how the uh, $5.4 billion in revenue uh, is spread over the next uh, 11 years, uh, both in terms of time, but also in terms of, uh, of uh, ultimate, uh, ultimately where the funds are directed. And uh, obviously, the first thing you'll note is that um, uh, the current fiscal year, fiscal year 22, uh, is a bit front loaded. Um, a lot of that was made possible by federal stimulus dollars um, that, uh, that provide a lot of it upfront funding. Uh, and then uh, in fiscal year 23, the fee revenue uh, starts, uh, uh, collections of the fee revenue start. Uh, obviously you'll note that again, the fee revenue is phased in. So it is smaller in earlier years, uh, climbing up to, uh, to essentially uh, its ultimate level uh, by fiscal year uh, 32. So I will um, I'll kind of briefly go through each of these um, uh, of these uh, uh, uses of funds uh, and give you just a little bit of background on uh, on each of those. So the state highway fund revenue. So this is the revenue coming from the bill, uh, ultimately coming from multiple sources, uh, multiple fees, as well as uh, some general fund transfers. Uh, totals about two point four billion through fiscal year thirty two. Uh, important thing to note is that uh, a, a a um, 
a large amount of those funds, about 1.4 billion of those funds, uh, are ultimately assigned uh, for debt service on those Senate Bill 267 COPs. Um, the uh, the residual, so you know, around a billion dollars over the course of a decade or so, uh, is flexible. Flexible in the sense that uh, it could be used to advance new ten-year plan projects um, you know, or uh, to supplement uh, existing CDOT programs like our, our surface treatment program. I think the uh, the a lot of the focus in the bill was on the ten-year plan. So I think um, uh, a lot of uh, a lot of these dollars ultimately, I think, will go into advancing. Uh, new projects that have been identified with our planning partners and prioritized uh, in that 10-year plan. Looking at the bridge and tunnel enterprise, uh, the, this is, uh, again, the existing enterprise at CDOT modified to include tunnel in the scope. Uh, fee revenue, again, begins in 23, uh, climbs to about $523 million uh, by uh, fiscal year 32. Um, again, just like with the state highway fund revenue, it's, it starts uh, lower, but uh, approaches uh, about 80 million a year uh, by the time uh, the fees are fully phased in in fiscal year 32. Non-attainment uh, enterprise uh, anticipated to generate about 184 million through fiscal year 32. Um, by the time we get to about fiscal year 32, you're, we're looking at about 40 million a year. Uh, in revenue to that uh, new enterprise. Um, again, that enterprise is focused on non the non-attainment area and air quality mitigation. So ultimately uh, it will be up to the board of that new enterprise, which is yet to be formed uh, to determine uh, exactly how uh, funds will be distributed, but anticipated that um, uh, that, uh, that, that uh, enterprise will fund uh, various uh, mitigations on CDOT projects, on, on state highway system projects and uh, uh, that uh, ultimately are uh, uh, intended to help us uh, reduce air quality mitigations and help uh, uh, maintain conformity in the air quality non-attainment area. Uh, as I mentioned, the bill created three electrification enterprises, one at CDOT, one at the uh, Department of Health and Public Environment, and one uh, at the Colorado Energy Office. Um, estimated that the revenue to those enterprises will be about $730 million uh, through fiscal year 32, uh, ultimately reaching a level of about 100 million. And you can see on this slide kind of how that revenue is subdivided among the three different enterprises, uh, each of which have uh, a, uh, a different scope uh, related to advancing uh, uh, elect fleet electrification in Colorado. Um, in the case of CDOT, uh, our piece is the clean transit enterprise, as that name uh, suggests. Uh, that enterprise would be focused on uh, on uh, electrifying the transit fleet in Colorado. Um, again, in the case of these enterprises, ultimately uh, we'll, we will uh, have new enterprise boards that will uh, provide governance, direct funds. Um, I will say, that, however, that there's um, it's, it's likely that uh, uh, these enterprises will, will follow a similar model to some of the existing uh, programs uh, related to electrification. Uh, and what I mean by that is, uh, is uh, uh, we'll, we'll likely see uh, competitive uh, application processes uh, and currently through those programs, locals uh, have been uh, strong competitors and have had a lot of funds awarded through those programs today. I would expect that there's probably a significant element of that in the, the new enterprise structure going forward that ultimately results in, in many of these funds going to local projects for, for uh, supporting electrification. Um, Multimodal mitigation options revenue. Uh, this uh, uh, um, uh, multimodal options fund uh, anticipated that we'll see about 463 million in revenue uh, through fiscal year 32. Um, the, you'll note uh, on this chart that uh, this uh, program has uh, has some upfront general fund and stimulus dollars. That's why you see the the large infusion in 22 and then um, uh, uh, some additional in 24 and 25 before uh, it kind of reaches a, a more base level of funding going forward. Um, this is a this program uh, statutorily, uh, the uh, the revenues are split between CDOT and locals 85%, 15%. So 85% of the multimodal options fund revenue uh, ultimately is allocated out to local projects um, through the MPO and TPR processes. So there's an MPO and a TPR distribution of, um, of each, uh, each entity's 
uh, share of that 85%. And then 15% uh, are statewide projects uh, directed by CDOT. Um, I think you'll see more information uh, in the months ahead on uh, what the, uh, the timing and exact process will be for uh, the uh, initial distributions uh, under this uh, uh, new source of funding. Um, I know that is, uh, is being looked at, uh, worked through right now. Um, this is an existing program. I think most of you are aware of that, um, but uh, when the program was set up, it was only funded for two years through Senate Bill 1. So it was anticipated that it was a short-term program and would go away. Uh, the fee bill essentially by providing a, a, a dedicated revenue source has made this uh, essentially a permanent program uh, and also added air quality mitigation to the uh, uh, list of eligible uh, activities. And then I'm, I'm kind of wrapping up here on my last couple of uh, uh, fund sources and then uh, happy to take any questions. Um, revitalizing Main Streets, uh, similar to the multimodal options program, this was a this is an existing program. However, it is an existing program that uh, uh, was set up uh, and anticipated to just be a short-term program. It did not have a sustainable funding source. Uh, the bill essentially put in place an ongoing funding source, making this a permanent program. Um, the, the bill, and actually also a companion bill, this legislative session um, had the effect of, uh, of, of putting a big infusion uh, up front into the revitalizing Main Streets program, over $50 million between the two. Um, and then uh, as you'll see in, uh, in subsequent years, we've, we've got a, a little bit of additional funding um, uh, spread over the next couple of fiscal years before this, uh, this steps down to, uh, I believe an ongoing program funded at the level of about 7.5 million a year through a general fund transfer. Uh, the, the Main Streets program is administered by CDOT, uh, but ultimately all those dollars uh, are awarded to local projects uh, through a uh, competitive process. So uh, those dollars ultimately uh, will be, be out uh, on, uh, in, on cities and towns throughout Colorado. Um, then finally, uh, last but certainly not least with this group, uh, the, uh, the bill also includes a, 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 a HUTF uh, revenue. Uh, to locals. So the dollars in the bill that are directed to the Highway User Tax Fund um, follow the existing HUTF formula that uh, puts about 60% uh, uh, um, of the, uh, the HUTF revenue to CDOT. That was the first slide we actually looked at. Um, 20, am I going to get this? 22% to counties, 18% to cities. Um, you'll see here again, because uh, this is uh, funded entirely through fee revenue that uh, the initial receipts uh, start lower um, as uh, the fee revenue is, uh, uh, put in, is, is put in place. And as the fee schedules uh, accelerate, obviously the revenue increases uh, and uh, looking at uh, about 150 million a year uh, to locals by the time uh, fully phased in in fiscal year 32. So I will, um, I'm gonna skip just a, a head here a slide and, uh, and just kind of recap briefly uh, on, on uh, essentially the local funding opportunities within the bill. Um, so, you know, obviously we just talked about the dedicated local HUTF revenue that, uh, that will uh, flow alongside the existing HUTF revenue uh, to cities and counties. Um, but uh, as I mentioned, uh, a lot of the funds that aren't uh, uh, going directly to locals ultimately uh, uh, end up with locals. And so, as I, as I mentioned, uh, the Multimodal and Mitigation Options Fund, 85% of those dollars um, will ultimately be allocated out to uh, local projects uh, selected locally uh, by planning partners in the TPRs and MPOs. So that 85% uh, that share is nearly, nearly 400 million over the next decade. Um, similarly, the revitalizing Main Streets, um, about 115 million of dollars through that program will be awarded to local projects over the next decade uh, through uh, a competitive process through that revitalizing Main Streets program. Um, and then finally, as we mentioned, we have the electrification enterprises, uh, uh, exact structure um, and uh, uh, approach to distributing funds to be determined by those enterprise boards. Uh, but if they look at all like uh, some of those existing electrification programs, uh, likely a lot of those dollars will also be available uh, uh, through a competitive process uh, for locally uh, selected projects. So I think I'll, um, I'll stop there. That's kind of the high level overview, but uh, certainly want to take any questions that you all might have. 
Thank you. Oh, am I on? Thanks, Jeff. Uh, appreciate it. And uh, I'll, uh, I'm not sure how much of this is a question because it was my, my question that I asked uh, um, Eric, uh, but uh, you kind of answered it in, in the last one, but just sort of to reiterate how the jurisdictions uh, get their paws on, on these new funds. And I know Michael King is on, so maybe he can touch on any of the three electrification um, enterprises and Rebecca's here, so she could obviously touch on any of the uh, Main Street uh, questions that we might have. But basically, if I'm hearing correctly, and again, I, this is probably more of a statement than a question, the MMOF will run through the PPACG process. However, ultimately it will go to the, the, the Transportation Commission uh, for adoption. So that's really the only thing that will flow through here. All of these other um, enterprises and uh, funding programs um, are on a competitive basis and the jurisdictions would make their applications direct um, as a jurisdiction to the appropriate entity. Again, electrification would be the enterprises, uh, main streets would be Rebecca uh, uh, over at CDOT. Is, is, that, a, is that correct? Yeah, yeah I, think you, I think you are accurate. Obviously the local HUTF revenue will flow directly to the cities and counties. The MMOF, um, the, uh, the, the funds flow through CDOT, meaning ultimately we're, we're talking about contracts executed between CDOT and the ultimate recipients. But uh, those projects ultimately are selected by PPACG, just like you do with your STBG or CMAC dollars. Uh, and then we contract with local entities. Um, and then um, with respect to revitalizing main streets and likely the electrification enterprises, I think you are also right that uh, um, you will uh, uh, partake in those uh, uh, fund sources through a uh, competitive application process. A competitive application process administered uh, by CDOT or one of the other entities in the case of the electrification enterprises. Because yeah, I, I'm I'm pretty sure uh, the folks at uh, MMT and, and others would like to make sure they they know how to get it, their hands on the bus electrification dollars. Um, we do have a question in the chat from from Gail. Um, any flow of bridge or tunnel funds to locals, or is that all by application? So the the bridge and tunnel enterprise dollars are um, dollars uh, that uh, uh, are focused on the state system. So we do have CDOT does administer an off system bridge program that provides some funding to off system bridges. Uh, but uh, in the case of the bridge and tunnel enterprise, we're talking about uh, on system bridge and tunnel projects. Okay. So Gail, hopefully that answers your question. Um, Andy, is there any questions in the conference room? Because I don't see any hands up in the uh, Zoom. I, I've got a question, but I don't see any other, any other hands up in the conference room right now. But uh, quick question, Jeff, and thank you much. Really great information. Uh, the air quality mitigation funds, I know the way it was set up, it's designed for those areas that are in non-attainment. Uh, yesterday, just got the numbers from CDPHE for the July ozone readings, and they're horrible. And it's a very good likelihood based on what we see that um, that that's our uh, future. It could take a couple of years until we're designated yep. non-attainment, but uh, the numbers are there from our two monitors for us to be uh, reclassified, unfortunately. Despite our best efforts, it's coming from wildfire smoke from other states, but I'm assuming that the life of the 10-year air quality mitigation fund, um, you didn't have to be a non-attainment this year. It, it, if we end up in non-attainment designated over the next two or three years or so, then we would qualify for those funds as well. Yes, that's correct. I think that's my understanding. Um, it is it is not say, you know, only if you're as of this date, are you eligible? Um, I believe that uh, uh, at, at any point, if a, another area is deemed uh, 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 designated non attainment that at that point in time, they would become eligible uh, to be funded through that, uh, that enterprise. Um, in other words, we, it, projects in that area would become eligible. Okay, um, I think we have a, a question from Victoria. Is the multimodal, uh, excuse me, now it's multimodal and mitigation options fund, I forget they changed the name, uh, still going to have a 50% local match, or is that uh, match somehow uh, scalable uh, based on anything that the uh, Transportation Commission looks at? So, and actually, if Rebecca is on, I might ask if she wants to, uh, to address that. She may... Uh... Uh, have a, a more current answer than I do. I think the, the answer I will give is that I, the bill did not uh, make any changes to the exi existing match structure. So I think 
Uh, at this point, uh, that will remain the same, but Rebecca can correct me if she's on and I, I'm misstating. Yeah, that, uh, I believe that's true, Jeff. And I will just add, um, you know, we have an opportunity now that these funds are long-term um, to apply some lessons learned from our implementation over the last few years. Um, and one of certainly the complexities we saw on our end was, was figuring out the match and the match relief. So I think we'll be taking a look at this program over the next couple of months and coming to stack and ultimately the Transportation Commission with some ideas on, on how we handle match relief requests um, and, and other ways to distribute these dollars that uh, hopefully minimizes some of the administrative burden on CDOT's end, but also on the locals. So we'll, we'll be looking where we can to make the program run a little smoother, but I, I believe that's right on the, the basic match requirement. Okay, and, and if I remember correctly, when the initial, when it was a uh, multimodal options fund, uh, there was the ability to make the case at the MPO level to the yep. Transportation Commission about either a hardship or something and, and get that, that match changed. Is, is that still the case with uh, now that it's multimodal option and mitigation? <laughs> I, we may have to rebrand, John. That may be the first step. It's a mouthful. But that's a, exactly what we want to look at. I mean, we understand that there will always be a circumstance where communities um, will need match relief. Um, but uh, how do we, we go about sort of making that determination? And that's what we need to figure out. Okay. So we've got uh, two more questions in the chat. I, I know we're running a little over, but I think let's let's try to get through these and then see if there's any other uh, in-person questions. Um, uh, Councilman uh, uh, Zulaga from uh, uh, Woodman Par Woodland Park, um, uh, can you speak uh, a bit on the revitalizing of Main Street funds and how will they be accessed locally? And I, yeah, and I'd ask, Re Rebecca's actually leading that, so I, I think you can get a, a better answer from her. Sure. Yeah, great question. Um, we've had a, this, this program in particular has really been um, sort of neat to implement. Um, yeah, I think Jeff noted in his slides that we've already received um, quite, a, quite a few dollars for this program. Most recently, uh, the state legislature allocated 30 million in stimulus dollars um, just at sort of the tail end of the fiscal year 21 year. So we've been um, issuing these, these dollars through a competitive program. Um, we took that 30 million, and I'll speak to the money we have in hand now because it's going to help inform how we move forward. But so for that 30 million, we sort of divided it into two tranches. We had 8 million that was for this uh, very, um, this rolling grant program of small grants, 150,000 or less, um, that we originally stood up to really help communities adjust to COVID in terms of their use of their sort of outdoor and transportation space. So Several towns um, wanted to move into the street space so their restaurants could still stay open. Um, so we these grants helped put up the bollards and the lighting and things like that. Um, it looks like we'll still need um, some version of that program going forward and we'll see over the next few months, but that's about 8 million of it. And then the other 22 million we allocated through uh, um, a sort of a bigger competitive program really to focus on safety projects, um, primarily on uh, where uh, you have busy urban arterials or in some of our smaller towns where the main street is also a state highway. There's just a lot of ideas out there. So we received 77 applications for those dollars. Uh, those applications, I think they closed at the end of May and we're going through now and reviewing them. So that was the approach we took for that 30 million. I think, again, a, another opportunity just from lessons learned in implementing this that'll help us administer the next program. Um, but I anticipate we'll sort of keep on that same vein, uh, make this a competitive program, make it as easy as we can for the locals to apply um, and get those dollars out um, into communities. So I think I saw a request for uh, contact information. I'm happy to provide that. We also have a, a good website. So I'll make sure and put that in the link this morning. Yeah, feel free. If, if there's anything that uh, you have that you can send to us, Rebecca, we'll, okay. we'll send it out by email to everybody. So we, we'll get that to Jess Bechtel and she'll distribute it to everybody. Fantastic, thank so, you. So we appreciate it. 
Um, John, and then for, yes. I have a question. It's Laura, Laura Cruz, mobility coordinator. Can y'all hear me? Sorry, I'm yes. far away from the Laura, microphone. Um, Rebecca, I just have a, a question for you guys. Um, I, I attended the webinar on the Main Streets grant um, back in May, I guess. Mm -hmm. um, but one of the things that I was wondering if you guys were looking at moving forward a multi-jurisdictional type of um, grant, I know that each jurisdiction had the opportunity to apply for a separate, separate grant, but are you looking at it from a multi-jurisdictional, um, having a different level um, per se? Hmm, Laura, I don't, we haven't talked about creating kind of a, a separate program within a program for that, but I also don't see why that wouldn't be an application that we'd sort of welcome. I don't know, do you have a specific example? Are you looking like multiple counties or, or, you know, an MPO and a transit agency or something? Can you help me understand what you're thinking there? Yeah, a, a good example of it is just the multi-jurisdictions that are just within, you know, this Pikes Peak area. So right down the road, we have Manitou and then we have yep. Mountain as well as um, Monument. And if there was a um, project per se that each one of these uh, municipalities wanted to work together on, whether it's a bike pedestrian project or or something to that effect that um, I know that the previous grant, there was uh, 2 million that a yeah. um, individual um, jurisdiction could apply for. But if we're looking at it from a larger perspective to connect some of these channels, um, that maybe there's a different level of funding that could be available for that. I understand. Okay. Uh, let's, let's talk about that. I'd be glad to talk to you offline. Um, we hadn't contemplated that yet. I, um, I'd have to talk to the woman, Molly Bly, who's administering the program day to day to see if she's kind of heard that from, from, um, from other locals. I, I'm intrigued by the idea. I think it's something we should consider. So um, I'll, I'll follow up with you if that's okay. Sounds good. Thank you. Okay, and then um, this will be the last question, unless, of course, uh, someone just really is insistent upon it. Uh, Gail again puts in the chat, uh, back to the off system bridge program, are those funds allocated by percentage or will there be more funding available as a result of bridge slash tunnel enterprise? Sure, so the, those funds, I, I don't believe uh, the off system bridge funds are allocated by a specific percentage. There's a special highway committee uh, that is actually composed of locals. I think it's representatives from uh, the from CML and uh, and Colorado Counties Incorporated that uh, sit on that special highway committee. And uh, I believe those uh, bridge projects um, won't get into. There's some eligibility criteria, and then they're ultimately, I think, competitively awarded. Um, un unfortunately, I say unfortunately because I know there is a lot of need for off system bridge. Uh, the uh, the fee bill does not direct any additional uh, funds. Uh, specifically to off-system bridge. Okay, so uh, Gail, hopefully that answered your question. And if nobody else has anything really burning, we're about 10 minutes past uh, uh, time on the agenda. Uh, so I think, uh, all right, I didn't hear anybody say anything. So we're gonna go ahead and move on to our next item on the agenda, which is again, uh, the uh, greenhouse gas um, rulemaking process. You know, I got so wrapped up in keeping us on, on target. I was rude. I, excuse me, Jeff. Thank you so much for your presentation. That, that was totally rude of me. I, I apologize. Not, not at all. Doing that, I got so worked up. I, <laughs> it's exciting stuff. No, happy, happy is, to, yeah. thanks for having me, John. Happy to join you. And if you have any other questions, please feel free to direct them my way. Yep. Nope. And you were great to do that for us. And, and again, you've always I've taken the time to answer all of my questions. So the last thing I want to do is just be like, brush you off on <laughs> the stuff. So not at all. Always for that. But again, thank you. All right. Actually getting us back uh, on the agenda. I apologize for that, everybody. Um, Rebecca White's here. She's going to talk about the greenhouse gas rulemaking process. I, I think you know over over the time um, we as PPACG staff have mentioned, hey, we think it's going to go to their quality control commission. Uh, luckily it moved over to uh, uh, CDOT and the Transportation Commission. Uh, so Rebecca and CDOT have been tasked with the, the, uh, the task of, of, of putting together what that process looks like as well as uh, the draft rulemaking. 
um, understanding that the state legislature put a lot of time um, reach constraints on them. So while it would be nice to say we need more time to do X or Y, unfortunately the legislature did not want to provide that flexibility. Uh, so they have some pretty hard uh, deadlines that they're up against. So Rebecca's going to uh, take take on that, and Jess Bechtel, if you could make Rebecca the co-host if she has any slides. Um, I will also mention uh, that uh, Transportation Commissioner Hickey is on the call, and she has been very involved in this process. So Commissioner, heads up, uh, as Rebecca's going through, uh, we might uh, call on you to, to interject, or, as, or especially when Rebecca's done, I might ask you to make a, a few comments. So with that, Rebecca, uh, uh, take it away, and uh, hopefully uh, you've got uh, uh, sh screen sharing capabilities. Okay, um, thank you so much, John, and good morning, everyone. I'm gonna do my best here to, to share the right screen. Uh, <laughs> you all see that. I think you have the wrong, there you go. Does it say greenhouse gas rulemaking? It does. Okay, perfect. All right. Yep. Um, thanks, John, for that that sort of tee up. And just to, to give me a sense of the time, um, we have about 15 minutes. If you go a little bit longer, uh, waiting for John to unmute, I'm sure that I'm sure that's fine. Yeah, take whatever um, time you need, Rebecca. Okay. All right. Yeah, we can we can run along. Yes, I could not find my unmute. Thank you. <laughs> You're seldom quiet, John. So I, was, I, I figured that was the case. Well, good morning again. Um, I'll just say as I sort of tee the, this deck up, um, what a what a great session this morning. And as I listen to each of the speakers, you know, it's I I uh, come to realize several times a week, actually recently, what an interesting time it is to work in transportation right now. I've been at CDOT about a decade, um, but never have we seen this sort of confluence of new money coming in at the state level, really for the first time in, uh, since 2009, and then potentially new money coming in at the federal level. Um, and at the same time, we have some really interesting policy issues before us, which I'll, I'll talk you through this morning, one of the bigger ones. Uh, so it just makes for some interesting and long days here. Uh, so the greenhouse gas rulemaking, I just wanted to, to step back just a minute so, and explain what kind of set us on this pathway to develop this rule. You know, first was the passage of uh, House Bill 1261, which set some pretty aggressive green, greenhouse gas targets statewide, transportation as the really the largest source of greenhouse gas emissions, uh, you know, is kind of front and center um, because that it is a major contributor and you can kind of see the pathway out to 2050 of the type of reductions uh, we need to see. That then led to uh, the greenhouse gas roadmap, um, which is really sort of a policy paper that the state agencies worked on for about a year. It was issued, um, gosh, I think uh, January of, of this year to really take those House Bill 1261 targets and turn them into uh, ideas for policy measures that'll get us there. And I wanna spend a second on this because I, I think it kind of helps explain um, the sort of the greater context here. So if you look at what's in the roadmap, there's a, um, the sort of requirement or a, a goal to get about 12.7 million metric tons of greenhouse gas emission reductions by 2030 from transportation. And, and these numbers are sort of broken down as follows. So we get about 6 million metric tons just from the increasing efficiency of the cars out, um, out there today. The new EPA rules um, as and the greenhouse gas requirements sort of at the federal level that's achieving um, higher and higher efficient vehicles. Then um, sort of within Colorado, we expect about another 2 million metric tons to really come from, um, in particular, the, the turnover to electric vehicles. And so there's a, a goal to reach 940,000 of those by 2030. If we reach that amount statewide, we would get about another 2 million metric tons. So that leaves about 4.7 um, million tons remaining. 
And what's the, the bottom section of this table just sort of breaks that down into the various strategies under consideration. So uh, the one at the top there, the greenhouse gas pollution standards for transportation plans, that's what I'll, I'll talk to you all about this morning. But there's also um, you know, some mention of what, what we could do over the long term on land use and incentives around that. There's some an effort now to look at uh, more we can do with heavy duty trucks, both in terms of their efficiency and as, as the technology comes along, electrification. There's even um, more work looking at the future, future vehicle standards post 2025, a concept called indirect source rules. And then um, you all have heard and uh, been involved in some of the discussions around front range rail and just sort of expanding transit. So there's a, a whole suite of opportunities and they're each sort of in a different place in terms of their development. Um, this this rulemaking I'll, I'll speak to this morning is probably furthest along um, because we've been at this for about eight months now um, and hopefully in a position to share a draft rule here in a few weeks. Um, but the, collectively, the thought is that all these strategies um, get us close to that 4.7 million metric tons. So no single policy would seek to achieve that entire amount. So moving to the next slide here. So, uh, John had mentioned Senate Bill 260 sort of uh, upped, the, uh, upped the requirements for us, um, and it certainly did. So the, while this concept has been in the roadmap for a while, what Senate Bill 260 said is um, CDOT in particular, go forth um, and develop this rulemaking. And for the agency and, and Dr. Cog and North Front Range, so not PPACG, the requirement in Senate Bill 260 is that those agencies update our transportation plans to be in compliance with this new rulemaking by October of 2022. So that sets us on a schedule. Um, and because it takes a while to update plans, we wanted to provide as much time as we could for that, at least a year. So that's part of what is pushing um, CDOT to try to get this draft rulemaking out and the, the concept developed so that we have a final requirements in, in place in time to give the agencies enough time to do this work. So what is the concept? So overall, the, the thought is, is that we would set a greenhouse gas pollution reduction level um, in million metric tons of, of carbon dioxide equivalent for transportation plants. And, and we talked uh, earlier this morning about ozone and um, ozone conformity, but it's a very similar concept to how ozone conformity works now for much of the front range, where you have sort of a, a ultimate level that you do not want to exceed, and you take all the projects in a transportation plan, you model the emissions resulting from all the vehicles using our transportation system, and you compare it against that reduction level. These requirements would apply both to CDOT and the MPOs because collectively we represent the state's tri um, primary transportation planning agencies. And again, that's pretty similar to how conformity works that it applies to the MPOs and non-attainment areas. But ultimately the thought is, is that um, through this rulemaking, we can really focus on providing more options um, more transit, um, more ability to move around our state differently. And so that's sort of one of the, the guiding principles with this work. So as I mentioned earlier, we set out on this path um, in January of 2021 um, with the publication of the roadmap, sort of knowing this was a key policy tool. But I think a really significant development and a positive one is that whereas for the sort of the first many months of this work, um, we had anticipated this rulemaking being housed in the Air Quality Control Commission. Um, with the passage of Senate Bill 260 and some other stakeholder work, um, this rulemaking has moved pretty much whole cloth over to CDOT. Um, so it will be issued by our Transportation Commission. I think that is a really positive development because uh, we understand and know the space uh, certainly better than, than any other agency in the state. 
Um, we also kind of know what's at stake and the importance that um, a viable transportation system plays. Uh, we also have the experience implementing the air quality conformity. So uh, that rulemaking moving over to us, I think was a really positive move, but it kind of, it up to the workload for sure. And so we have been um, working for quite a few months through a stakeholder process. In fact, when we kicked this work off in January, the first thing we did was convene a greenhouse gas advisory group. It's got about 25 folks from across the state I see a lot of um, uh, names on, on this meeting this morning of, of folks who are on that group, including Commissioner Williams. John participates uh, very regularly. So we really wanted to have a diverse set of voices and expertise. Uh, this is a certainly a kind of a new concept for greenhouse gases. It's a new concept for Colorado. It's a difficult one. And so we wanted to have a really good sort of kitchen cabinet group. So they've been meeting for the past seven months. Um, we've also been doing a lot of stakeholder discussions. We've had about 11 meetings, uh, virtual meetings across the state as we, we've thought about this. We've um, participated in some statewide listening sessions with our partners at CDPG. And all together, we've had about 800 people join us through those various conversations. And then the real work has been through a lot of individual stakeholder meetings. Um, we meet weekly with the NPO staff, often presenting at groups like this, as well as the boards. We've been working with the Colorado contractors. Uh, the environmental um, groups, of course, are very interested in this and various sort of um, quasi-government associations like the CCI and CML and CCAT, CC4CA. And then to really share our thinking, uh, last month we issued a white paper that just talks through um, what this concept is, what it means, what are the big policy issues. And I put a link there in the chat. Um, if you have some spare time, it's about a 20 page paper, but it was really helpful, I think, to kind of share our thinking and get some interaction on it. So where are we in terms of, of issuing this rule? Um, the Transportation Commission voted in June to go ahead and um, require the CDOT staff to develop an issue and, and move forward in this rulemaking. So we have the support of the commission to move forward. Staff has been working very hard with the MPO staff on the draft rule. And right now our plan is to issue that draft with the, um, we file it with the Secretary of State's office on August 13th. We only have a couple times a month that we can file a draft rulemaking. So this is that August date. Then we would um, convene about a 60 day public review period. Um, so a written comment period over 60 days. And during that time, we plan to have five uh, hearings around the state. Um, of course, depending on COVID, but if if uh, things go well, we'd sure like to have those at least as a hybrid, both in person and with a virtual option. Um, and we would come to, right now we're looking at Colorado Springs, Grand Junction, Denver, the Fort Collins, Greeley area, as well as Durango, and have a, an opportunity for folks to join us, hear about the rule, and provide written comment. And then sort of depending on, on the feedback we receive, uh, right now we're anticipating being able to adopt, um, ask the commission to adopt a rule in November uh, of 2021, which would make the rule effective sort of early next year. And again, giving just shy of a year or so for the relevant MPOs and CDOT to update our plans to be in compliance. Um, I will pause there for a minute and see if Commissioner Hickey wanted to provide any perspective because this rulemaking is within the um, jurisdiction of the Transportation Commission. And I, I think she's uh, sort of um, in two places at once this morning, so I'm not sure if she's still on. Thank you so much, Rebecca. This is Lisa Hickey, Transportation Commissioner for District 9. And I really appreciate that presentation. I I really appreciate this workshop overall. As Rebecca said at the beginning of her comments, I think it's a great opportunity and the information is new, uh, some of it brand new and um, just so exciting to see the funding and changing happening. 
uh, for policy to help you do what you do well at PPACG. Um, we are developing the rulemaking process itself and the hearing schedule, as Rebecca noted. We will, some of the committee members, I chair the Greenhouse Gas Committee, which we call the Ad Hoc Agency Coordination Committee at the commission, and a committee member will be at the hearing, but it will be managed by a hearing officer appointed by the state for us to manage those hearings. We anticipate a lot of input and we want to hear from you in the form of written comments is uh, very helpful. And uh, if you have input, please provide written comments during this process. It will be fast moving, but staff has worked very hard to get a lot of input over the past uh, going on nine months now. Um, so with that, I'll pause and uh, look forward to hearing from all of you when the rule is issued. Thank you, Commissioner. And the, the last slide here, and then I'll open it up to questions, is just a couple of links um, to engage with us as a sort of official stakeholder, get on email list. Um, of course, we will be sharing the all of that pertinent information with the MPO, and I'm, I'm sure John will send it out. But if you want to get those updates directly, this is sort of the, the way to engage with us. Um, you know, I'm I'm certainly happy to talk to anyone individually and sort of talk through and answer questions. It's very much the space we're in now, sort of recognizing the importance of this policy and really wanting to get some um, different perspectives. So uh, let me pause there, John, and, and happy to take any questions. Uh, thanks, Rebecca. Really appreciate you taking the time to uh, uh, do the presentation again, since you're meeting with the 800 different folks uh, on a daily basis and everything else. I, I know this has uh, consumed your life uh, uh, to that. I know you wanted to go hiking on Friday and you ended up spending about an hour on the phone with me and Andy, so I uh, appreciate it. So with that, uh, Jess Bechtel, um, can we, or, or maybe Rebecca stop sharing and then we get all everyone's uh, faces up here to see if I see any hands. Uh, Andy, do you have any questions in the conference room? None so far. And I, I see uh, none on uh, the Zoom yet. Uh, so uh, Rebecca, we have a couple of our uh, military installations um, on the call here. I, I see at least uh, two or maybe three military planners. Uh, to the extent that uh, um, the GHG rule will impact the how the MPO um, will do project selection. Is, is there anything uh, particular that our military partners need to know or be aware of, or just only to the extent that they roll into the um, uh, long range planning process? Yeah, I'm, I'm, I think that the latter point's the right one, only to the extent that um, there's uh, you know, an important part of the PPACG region. And, and as you all look at your transportation plans over the future, you know, we've, uh, we don't have the, uh, this rule won't impact the military institutions uh, in particular. Uh, doesn't roll up that way, <laughs> but uh, I'm, I'm glad to have their voices here. And, and certainly the, the bases have already done, I think some really remarkable work in this space. And um, and are in some cases far ahead of us in looking at greenhouse gases. So I, I appreciate that uh, you guys have that um, experience down there as well. Awesome. So um, again, I see no questions here. If there's any there, Andy? Uh, 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 no questions here, except I, I do have one, uh, Rebecca. This is super helpful. Really appreciate you taking the time to, to brief us. Uh, again, this is, this is good information. Question about timing and, and details. You mentioned that the, the notice for rulemaking will be filed uh, Friday, August 13th is what I jotted down. So I'm assuming that that's details have to be filed when you do the notice notification. Is that correct? So that's what yeah, we that is the, the draft rule itself, Andy. Okay. So, yep. yep. All right. Okay. So at least by next Friday, Friday a week from now, um, we would know what those details are then, if not yep. sooner. Okay. And I, I just realized, as we've all said that, that is indeed Friday the 13th, <laughs> which I hope doesn't uh, doesn't bode anything uh, in particular. <laughs> Coincidence yeah. or, or not? Okay. Yeah. Yeah. All right. 
Well, if I seeing no questions, uh, thanks again, Rebecca. Really appreciate you taking the time to uh, do everything. If I could trouble you to send uh, either me or just Bechtel the uh, slideshow that the slide deck you just used because it had a lot of links in there, we're, we'll send it out to everybody um, who was on the, the call. So with that, Andy, um, that concludes the part of our agenda. I'll, I'll kick it back over to you for the legislative um, uh, portion of the, the thing, uh, the legislative committee. And, and again, for those of you who aren't part of the legislative committee, you're, you're free to stay on the line, um, but uh, it, it takes on a little different tenor of, of that. So Andy, it's all yours. Okay, all right, uh, thanks. And uh, council member uh, Thompson is just coming back into the room as we get into the board slash uh, legislative discussion portion and kind of an open uh, discussion. One thing I will mention, and uh, maybe before Mayor Wilson leaves the room as well, uh, one thing that we, we talked about having uh, discussed uh, as well, and if not today, then we'll, we'll schedule to make sure we have some time the next time we get together on the 16th, uh, two weeks from today, but had a really good uh, discussion with folks in um, Monument a couple of weeks ago around a, a water uh, project that they're interested in um, figuring out how to how to pursue and how to uh, seek funding for it. Um, and there, a lot, there was a lot of interest in the, the federal infrastructure uh, discussion uh, this morning around uh, that, that as a possibility. Uh, but obviously with the details just now kind of coming out over uh, the past 24 hours, we don't have a whole lot of information to really share at this point. But um, it definitely wanted to uh, set aside uh, at least a little bit of time to chat about that and again, if not today, we could uh, line that up for the 16th, um, but uh, had a good meeting, like I said, with Mayor Wilson, uh, Town Manager Mike Foreman, and Amy Latham from the uh, Cherokee uh, Metro District and a couple other Metro district Districts there as well. And I know they're having conversations with the county and some other stakeholders um, about trying to figure out how, as a region, as a community, um, we could potentially all get behind a, a big uh, water project uh, like that. So not to put uh, Mayor Wilson on the spot, but not sure if you or I think Mike Foreman might be on the line as well, if you want to amplify anything or, and should we see it, set aside some time for the next meeting on the 16th to drill into that in a little more detail? Yeah, I'd love to uh, set aside some extra time for that. But yeah, this presentation today did bring up uh, some possible new possibilities. Um, and we'd like to find out more about those uh, particularly the water infrastructure finance and innovation mm -hmm. part of the federal bill. So uh, if our if our uh, board would like to get together in the future, I'll have a uh, mic there and possibly Amy there if we can schedule it to discuss the whole project. But it would serve region wide. It it would mm -hmm. create some redundancy and and. Uh, uh, strengthen the area water wise. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that, that sounds great. And I think, um, you know, Eric gave us uh, some uh, tips as far as where to kind of dig in uh, to find some additional information, National League of Cities and potentially some other uh, stakeholders, we can uh, try to hunt down some information on um, what some possibilities might be out there at the federal level. Um, but yeah, we can certainly set aside some time on the 16th when we get back together for the uh, workshop number two um, to dive into that in a little more detail. Okay. Um, with that, I don't know, not to put um, Commissioner Elsner and Council Member Thompson, our chair, our co-chairs of our legislative committee on the spot, but anything, anything you learned today that we need to maybe chat about from a legislative standpoint or other topics that we might want to consider? Obviously, a lot of stuff happening at the federal level, and we've talked about getting a little more organized to go after federal uh, funding opportunities and engage more with our uh, federal delegations. We've been talking regularly with their staff members to try to get the, our congressmen and maybe senators at a meeting, a PPACG meeting at some point, if not in person, have them zoom in when it's uh, convenient, if we can during a board meeting or maybe for a separate uh, session. But any thoughts, any, any takeaways from think, this morning? Uh, yeah, this is Dick Elsner. I think you said it well, we need to uh, get our federal people involved to, to try to get some money for um, specific items uh, you know, the interstates through Colorado are in absolutely ridiculously poor shape, uh, not because of what CDOT is doing, but because of weather and, and uh, just the fact that we've had lot, lack of funding. And I think uh, I'd like to see on the federal side uh, more emphasis on 
putting our highways back together, you know, uh, across Colorado and everywhere else, but uh, with an emphasis there. Statewide, um, I think the, the greenhouse rulemaking is going to be interesting, see where it comes out, and then we'll uh, see what happens in the next legislative session. So, uh, Commissioner Elsner, and uh, Andy, if you don't mind me jumping in, I, I'm maybe just uh, buzzed in a second before you were about to say exactly what I'm going to say. You know, a part of the, the issue is that uh, I think the the big east eastern states saw the handwriting on the wall that uh, they were losing population. You know the the Rust Belt to the Sun Belt uh, uh, and fast growing states like Colorado and others um, were surpassing them in population. So I think it was back in 2007 or 2008 uh, they basically said, "Hey, whatever everyone gets in pop in distribution uh, today." is what we get in distribution in the future. So we're basically working off the, the census numbers from, uh, well, I think it was a, a, a mid-decade census of 2005 or 2000, depending on the funding source. And they basically froze us to those numbers. So the last three reauthorization bills has not addressed uh, that inequity in that fast growing states get punished, states that were, were are not uh, continue to have their funding based on the heyday of when it was. So um, Andy and, and, and lesser extent me have been working with um, the, uh, the Western states um, metropolitan planning organizations to sort of uh, talk about this and see how we can um, uh, get some change there in, in the funding formulas. Because even when they, um, they make the pie bigger, that's great. But to a large extent, um, the pie's not being divvied up fairly based on the way it had been for literally decades. Um, all of a sudden, the people who said we want to do it by population because they had population um, changed the rules on us. Um, and quite frankly, it's 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 just plain unfair. So um, we're working with our our partners there and uh, others in the state to address that. So, Andy, I don't know if you want to go any more detail about anything else uh, on the Western states thing, but uh, the federal distributions do need to be addressed. Yeah, uh, well put. And we can maybe put that on the agenda for the 16th when we do get back together and, and drill into this in a little more detail and see if there is something actionable that we as a body could do. We've got a ton of stuff in common with Utah, Arizona, New Mexico, and Nevada. Those are the main states we've been working with. A couple others as well. Idaho, I think, has been part of these conversations. Um, but as John said, we're basing our the revenue distribution for, a state trans for federal transportation money on a 2000 formula basis, 2000 population. So as we fall further and further behind in our faster growing states, you know, New York and Michigan and Pennsylvania, they've kind of baked in this um, uh, uneven formula. So we think there's ways to make it right and hold harmless those other states, but, um, but it, we're, it's gonna take a pretty concerted effort, but it, there's enough interest, I think, by the regional agencies that have been working across these different states to try to figure out, you know, let's try to, let's try to fix it. If we don't ask, if we don't push it, then it's never gonna get fixed. And at some point, you know, we're already 21 years in. Um, it, it just, it's, it's crazy to keep uh, down this path. So we'll develop some information and maybe put that on the agenda and see if there's something we could uh, take some action on engaging with our, uh, our federal delegation. One other item I was going to mention real quickly is looking at the timing of what uh, Rebecca just presented on greenhouse gas emissions, not to spend both of our workshops on GHG emissions issues, but those rules are coming out on Friday the 13th at the latest, and our next workshop is on Monday the 16th, so we might want to set aside a little bit of time to maybe brief the, the group, whoever joins in on the 16th, uh, what we're seeing so far in those draft uh, rules. So hopefully we'll have some time to really kind of get our arms around it and, and see what it looks like for our, our region as well. Um, but obviously the 13th, when the rules get released, that's after our normal August board meeting. So the next chance for us to really talk about it would be on that in that workshop on, uh, on the 16th. So we might set aside a little bit of time to kind of brief you on what we're seeing so far with that, uh, the uh, rulemaking effort. And Andy, can we put it on the TAC agenda for that Thursday as well, please? Sure. John, we'll put that on for sure. Okay. Yeah, we, we, we can we can do that. Okay. Anything else by others? Uh, board members, any thoughts? Follow-up things we should consider? Takeaways from today? 
hopefully this was helpful. There's a lot of material went into some of the weeds on on some things, but uh, you know, like everybody's uh, recognized, there just there's an awful lot happening at the state level and and federal level. So we thought this was uh, that this was timely. Yeah, I appreciate you guys putting it together. And for those of us that live in the weeds, it's really nice to see, to uh, get that detail. Yeah, and sure. again, uh, oh, yep. Go ahead, John. No, I was just gonna say, and just, just wanted to remind everybody that again, we're we're gonna do this again on the on the sixteenth, so uh, two weeks, same uh, bat time, same bat channel. And um, let's see, I know um, Michael King is, is gonna be here to talk about electrification. Um, all the, the those three different enterprises. Why one Michael's uh, has um, through C that he is in 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 contact with the other two. So he's going to talk sort of talk about all three again how they uh, may work because I think we're still early in the process. But uh, that is on the agenda. The other thing on the agenda uh, was uh, to have uh, Spencer Dodge with the Front Range Passenger Rail. Um, not only will he talk a little bit about the, the legislation and, 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 and what that means, uh, but some of the other things that are going on with um, Front Range Passenger Rail. But more importantly, um, I think something that is going to be a definite happening in the near term is the uh, with Amtrak uh, probably getting a lot of their funding uh, that they, they were seeking uh, through this bill. Um, they're looking at hoping to uh, spearhead the um, through car service for the Southwest Chief. So we've also asked um, um, uh, Spencer to talk about the South Southwest Chief through car service um, on that meeting on the 16th, uh, because that will be important. And um, hopefully um, Brian Vitulli and our friends with Metro uh, Mountain Metro will be able to be part of that meeting as well, because I think um, some of the exciting things they're trying to do with uh, um, facilitating that Southwest Chief through car service, they need a place to stop, right? So uh, to the extent that Spencer talks about everything, uh, we'll still need to talk a little bit, or I think you would find it interesting to find out um, how we facilitate that service um, with some sort of a, a depot or station. Um, and that's a, a, a study that uh, uh, Brian and MMT are working on. So in addition to that, we'll, we'll probably uh, have uh, that be part of it as well. And originally the final part of that agenda on the 16th was Andy and I were going to talk about sort of how this all impacts us sort of thing. I, I'm not sure that we need that at this point. I think at this point, um, the main uh, thing is, uh, like Andy said, well, he, he wanna, he's added a couple of things that we could talk about, maybe some of the, the federal stuff, as well as um, what we've seen from the greenhouse gas. So we might uh, uh, tweak or adjust the agenda some, uh, remove, uh, uh, that uh, sort of part where Andy and I were uh, 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 talking and, and make it more of a, a see if we can't focus in or bring speakers in to hit those two topics. Um, so I just wanted to do that. Brian, I saw you had your camera on real quick. Did, did, did you have something you wanted to add about the uh, Front Range Passenger Rail? I, I didn't want to exclude you there. No, just since you mentioned my name, I thought I should turn my camera on. So thank okay. you. <laughs> Good to see you. All right, uh, so I just want to remind everybody about the 16th. So Andy, back to, back to you. Okay, and I think uh, I think that pretty much wraps it up. Uh, this was really good. Appreciate everybody's interest and participation. Um, if you have other thoughts, uh, questions, uh, things that you want us to try to cover on the 16th, uh, please let John or, or myself let, let us know and uh, we'll try to work it in there. But uh, thanks again, and we'll see you all in, in two weeks. Appreciate it. All right, thank you, Randy. This was very useful for me. Good, good to hear. Yeah, thank you. This is Holly, have a great day. <clears throat>